okay? Just to bring us up to date of what's actually going on in the world today, we, we keep hearing this term, the New World Order. We heard um, the president, when he, when he went out of office, before he went out of office, Reagan, in 1989, talking about the New World Order. And since Bush been in office, he's been talking a lot about the New World Order. Okay? Matter of fact, when we went to war with Iraq, that's what that was all about, he said. He said that what we wanted to do was the New World Order is so important that we must have all the world to unite. And so this was the first major war or massacre, however you want to phrase that, in reference to the establishment of the New World Order. Now, in during the time of Bush, I mean not Bush, but during the time of Reagan, Reagan got together with Gorbachev, and Gorbachev and Reagan promised the world that we would have a utopia, that they would be able to blow up their bombs, nuclear farm, the Cold War, that would be over, the nuclear threat, so you, can, you don't have to worry about these bomb shelters anymore, and that that would be all behind us. And so, since that particular time, during, at least during that time, that's when Gorbachev came to America and spoke to some of the um, universities. Reagan went over to Moscow and spoke at their universities. And many people didn't know what, what they were talking about. But there was something interesting that was reported that when Gorbachev came to America, he mentioned that he was glad that we accepted the New World Order. Because he said that with the New World Order comes a one world religion. See, many people didn't know about that aspect of it. So part of the New World Order would be a one world religion, a one world government, and now as we're looking today, we're seeing the common markets unite, or Europe uniting, and as Europe unites, that they're trying to go on the one currency. And then that would be the currency that they would try to force everyone else into a one world economy. So we see three major things that the New World Order talks about. A one world government, one world economy, and a one world religion. Now, obviously the one world religion will affect us drastically because if our religion and the New World Order, or the, the New World Order religion don't agree, there's a conflict, okay? And we saw what they did to someone who was out of conflict in reference to the one world government that was Iraq. The whole world united together to destroy it. So the same thing obviously will happen in the last day. And we know the Bible lets us know that all that shall live godly shall suffer persecution. So one thing we're going to be able to see out of this new world order, we're going to see um, when two things don't agree, when the one world government or the Antichrist government is set up or religion is set up, and we who are trying to follow the Lord, as we try to follow Him, that that's where we're going to have a lot of conflict. Okay, but not just that. Some of us also want to be able to define the other events that have been happening. When we went to war over in Iraq, I don't know if many people knew, but when we went to war over there, I guess we could call it a United Nations war, since everyone united together over there, there was an article that was written in the Times magazine, and you can get it, it's on March 4th, 1991, and on page 25, it had something very interesting to say, something that we who are students of prophecy and of last day events, is something that's recorded something similar to reporting. What it says is, the quote that we're be quoting is, on the Sudanian borders, Iraq torturing of Kuwait oil facility caused darkness at noon. Now this is an actual picture of actually showing you what it looked at high noon. Okay, the day was turned to darkness. Okay. That's something very interesting that should have caught a lot of people's eyes and attention. 
It's the same thing when Mount St. Helens erupted and some of the other volcanoes that they were talking about over um, in the western part of the United States, that there was darkness over there also because of um, all the soot that was thrown in the air. Okay, so we're seeing different things that the Bible talks about, little aspects of it coming to being. The reason why we also wanted to mention that is we also know that in past history that there was also the darkening of the sun and the moon turning blood, and we also had the falling of stars. So we're just trying to get us to realize that there's lots of things that are going on. And if we're studying our Bible, we'll be able to see some of the things that are going on. Now, this piece that we were promised with the New World Order was most likely a false piece. Because ever since we had that war in Iraq, how much peace has there been on the planet? There's fighting over there in Russia. We know that there's a lot of fighting going on in Africa, and um, such that um, Somalians, that a lot of them are dying, by the millions are dying daily. It's just from starvation and people not being able to get food over to them. We also see over in um, Yugoslavia that there's lots of wars over there, and everyone is fighting amongst themselves. Now that was nothing but a kickoff from World War II when the SS, which was the Secret Service, or the Eustaxis it was called, that they persecuted all of those people that were Protestant. And if you wasn't Protestant, I mean if you were Protestant, then the SS, a lot of them were dressed up as monks. And so what they did, they were prized with, from the Catholic Church, and if you didn't convert over, they would bring in um, they, would bring, they would bring in the people, and they would bring the priests, and they would tell everyone that they had to convert over. And if they didn't convert over, they killed them. And a lot of that was in newspapers, and a lot of that has been not in history. But there are books, there are a few books that mention and give you the description and the accounts of what actually happened. And because of that, um, the people in Yugoslavia after World War II was over, those people were basically in charge. The Catholics wasn't the ones in charge. And so now that they got their independence and everything, the communist West, I mean, East common bloc had fallen, what they started to do now was, instead of them being persecuted by the Catholics like in World War II, now it's the reverse. Those who were afraid and who were persecuted before are now persecuting the Catholics. And that's why we have that war over there. But I think maybe one or two times that was mentioned in the news. But all the other times, they never tell you about that past history and what's actually going on, of why there's so much hatred over there. Because they're afraid that if they become independent again, that then they can do what they did again at World War II against them. And so they're trying to kill them off to stop that. Okay? So there's lots of things actually going on. Now we know that this war, I guess, started on January 16th, 1991, when we, I guess, on Martin Luther King's birthday, people was upset about that because that's when we decided to go to war on his particular birthday, he was supposed to be a man of peace. Okay, so we can see clearly that there is a false peace going on. Now, at the same time, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with, in New York City, there's an individual who claims to be the Messiah. He's an Hasidic Jew. Okay, now this Hasidic Jew um, has people who's in the newspapers and so forth throughout New York, and I'm not sure how many people know in Delaware down in this area, but he claims to be the Messiah. And they're planning to take him over to Israel and to make some announcements about that. He's pretty old. He might be in his late 80s or early 90s. He's a pretty old individual. But if you know anything about the Hasidic Jews, they're one of the most strictest Jews there are. They memorize basically the whole Old Testament. So they were not dealing with people that don't know the word of God, that's for sure. Okay? So we can see that going on at the same time. Okay, and at the same time, we see today that the world is in what type of a, a recession or moving into a depression. And we want to know is the Bible talk anything about? a worldwide famine of depression in the last days. 
We're going to talk about some of that today. And we're in the recession. And if this thing keeps on continuing, even though the president keeps assuring us that we're pulling out, you know, things are getting better and all of that, but every time, every month, we keep hearing about General Motors laying off thousands. We keep hearing about other companies laying off thousands. So there seems to be a little deception in practice. And so it seems like it might be getting worse. And if so, if we're going to be moving into a world depression, which was worse than 1929, the Great Depression, then we got some things that we should be looking forward to. Matter of fact, if they plan to bring the New World Order, I guess they don't really have much of a choice about that. And so we're going to be talking about this book by Larry Burkett called The Coming Economic Earthquake. Also, there's another book that uh, people wanted to um, know about. I think it's called The, um, the Depression, the 1990, the, the Great Depression of the 1990s. So people are saying that it's pretty clear what's actually going on even though everybody does not know what's going on. We're also going to be talking about um, another group of individuals, which I, I assume we know a little bit about, and they're called the New Age. The so New Age is nothing new, but the New Age has been something around for quite a long time. Matter of fact, um, if you remember back in the 60s, there was a, um, an album that was called The Age of Aquarius, okay? And that was nothing but to bring in the New Age, okay? That's what they were thinking about, the New Age. We also know about that people are expecting a thousand year reign, millennium, of Christ, okay? So we're seeing that coming to fruition. Okay, but what is this about this New Age movement? How many people know a lot about the New Age movement? Okay, now we want to go back and just try to go back in time of what is the New Age movement? Well, we're going to be reading some articles from their literature of how they define themselves and what their goals and aims are. Well, if you go back in time, back into the 1700s, 1776, you'll read up on something that's called the Illuminati. Now, many people don't talk about the Illuminati today. Matter of fact, I think in most major encyclopedias, they just describe the Illuminati as a, a world conspirator of people that, um, that Christians and other people are paranoid about. And they really, that they didn't exist, but people thought they existed back in the 1700s. But if you get yourself right, an encyclopedia before the 1900s, they are right at least maybe three or four of the ten pages of the Illuminati. What their conspiracy was, what it's all about, and how they plan to take over the new world or take over the world. Okay? So there seems to be a, uh, a denying of the Illuminati existing today. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, it was clear. People were put to death if you were thought of being part of it. Matter of fact, um, way back, um, in the 1500s, that's when they really started. I think they were called the Abrano. In the book Alberto, it describes some of their history. And what happened was that they were found out that they were trying to take over all the countries of Europe. And so everybody was put to death except for one person, which was called, his name was called um, Agnostic Leo. He was the, the founder of the Jesuit Order. Okay? He was the only one that was put to death because he was protected by the Pope. Okay? And since then, they went underground and went under a new name, which is called the Jesuits. And the Jesuits were the ones who were a continuation of the Abramos. So they went from under Abramos' name unto the Jesuits. And now from the Jesuits, they decided to set up a new organization so no one could ever trace the world conspiracy back to them. And the new name is called the Illuminati. The founder of that was Adam, Adam Weissach in 1776. And we celebrate it. Most of the world celebrates their, um, their founding by celebrating May Day. Now, some of y'all might remember about people used to walk around the Maypole. But that's where that came from. Okay? The communists 
um, celebrated in some places in America and different parts of Canada and throughout the world, they celebrate May Day. Okay, so that's what the Illuminati was all about. Okay, and if you look on the back of a dollar bill, if everybody has a dollar bill, you can take one out and you'll be able to see that this is nothing new, this is not something we're making up. This is something that's right on your dollar bill. Okay? So it's a very deep conspiracy. It's not a something that was planned last night. Something that goes way back into the 1700s, 1500s. Okay? You want to bring it close? Okay. okay. On the back of your dollar bill, where you have the pyramid with the eye on the top of it, now many people don't know what that pyramid means and what that eye is. What well, that eye on the top of it is the all seeing eye of Lucifer. Hmm. That's what it is. If you go back into the Mason books, they will find all of these things for you in the Masonic logic and so forth. And if you look directly underneath it, there's something that's written in Latin. It's called Nevus Odor Sikor, which means in, um, in our language, New World Order. That's all it means. Okay? There's many books that are written on this already. That's the mind that, that tells you all it is and that informs you to let you know all of these different things. Okay? So this isn't what I'm what, what, what I'm sharing with you is nothing new. Okay, this is not an invention of humanity. Okay? These are in books, they're documented and so forth. Okay? So that's not complicated. Okay, so we just want we at least wanted to inform you about some of these things that are actually going on. Okay? There's this book that's out. I would suggest that many people might not be fond of the author, but he does a good documentary on the New World Order. He talks about the Illuminati. He talks about the dollar bill. He talks about a lot of the things we just talked about. But he gives you a foundation. And he goes as far back as Adam Weissach. And this is where we differ, because that's where he stops. But as you know, a little earlier, I go all the way back to the Jesuits, okay? And I go back beyond the Jesuits to the Abraham, okay? So we go back a little further than he does. So he at least give you um, a little background up until that time, okay? But now if you go back even further than the Abrahams, you can go back in history even farther than that. And I link it all the way back. You can sit up on the table, okay? No problem. Um, I go back from, matter of fact, I have a little chart, and we might get a chance on the weekend to discuss it, but I go back, um, linking us back to Nimrod, okay, back to the time of Nimrod, we go all the way back to, which is the Tower of Babel, and that's where really the first world order was, okay, so the new world order is really nothing to do with nothing but the old world order, and then I go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, to Lucifer himself, and to the first lie that he gave to Eve. Okay? So that's how far I go back. And then I go back just one step further of when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. Okay? Okay, so that's where the trend is. So this thing is a world conspiracy, and it goes all the way back in time. Okay? It's not something new. It goes way back in time. Okay, now there was something else, one book, but it's not an easy reading book. And this book is almost a thousand pages long. And it's called The Keys of This Blood. Now some people might want to know whose blood is we talking about. Well, they think it's the blood of Christ. I don't think it's the blood of Christ. I think it's the blood of the conspirator. Okay? Now the subtitle of this book is pretty interesting. It's called The Struggle for World Domination between Pope John Paul II, Carl Gorbachev, and the capitalist West. 
So we see here three powers trying to take over. Okay? And they are clear that they are trying to dominate and control the world. Matter of fact, I'd like to at least read a, um, a passage, a few passages out of here. So we can know what we're talking about. Okay, we talked a little bit about the millennium, okay? We know that people are looking for the thousand years of ushering in the Christ's reign. And many people forget that also with what about the counterfeit? What can that mean? Lucifer will set up this to try to what? Two. Okay? Okay. Also at the same time, I forgot to mention to you, but over in Israel, they're, they're planning and getting everything together to build the temple. Okay? They have, they, um, for a while, for a long time, they had lost the purple in their coloring to make the robes for the high priest. They found those pearls and those, um, those oysters and so forth, a certain type of fish they needed, clams, and they started those, and they started, and they have them now in their own, they found them in the Mediterranean Sea, they thought they were all dead and didn't exist anymore, and they have them in, in their own aquarium. And they're trying to harvest many of them. They can have all the purple that they need for their rule. Also, at the same time, they found the incense, okay, over in archaeological um, digging. They found the incense. They've been trying to head hunt down the, um, the ashes of the red hut, of the red heifer. Now, they did find some red heifers, and they have now taken the red heifers that they found around the world, and they brought them over to Israel, and they have one place, that's all they do, they just raise red heifers, just for the sacrifice, so that they can start the sacrifice. Okay, they also, some people believe that they've found already, and it's been in Ethiopia for years, when King Solomon apostatized that, um, that when the Queen of Sheba came over, the Bible talks about that she took back with her and her son, and in Ethiopia, people have been able to define that the Ark of the Covenant is there, and it's been there for years. And people have documented, people have seen it, and all of those type of things. So they believe they have the ark. Now the only thing that they have problems with is trying to build at this point. And so they're bringing everything together so that when everything is ready and they can build, everything will move right into smooth. Okay? Okay, in this book here, this is what it says. It says that we are the states. This is on the first page, it's not even numbered. Really page 15, I assume. We are the states, for the competition is over who will establish the first one world system of government that has existed, that has ever existed in the society of nations. It is about who will hold and will the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community over the entire six billion people. No holes are barred because once the competition has been decided, the world and all that is in it. That's the competition, that's what they're fighting over. Our way of life as individuals and as citizens of the nations, our families, and our jobs, our trade and commerce, and money, remember we talked about the one world economy, our educational system, our religion, that's what we talked about, the one world religion, and our culture, even the badges of our national identity, which most of us have always taken for granted, all will be powerfully and radically altered forever. No one can be exempt from its effect. No sector of our life will remain untouched. Now this is what they're writing and this is what they're over. Now many of us don't know that what they're doing. But this is what, that's why these are clearly the last scenes of verse history. As to the time frame involved, those of us who are under 70 will see at least the basic structure of the new world government installed. Those of us under 40 will surely live under its legislative, executive, and juridical authority and control. 
as a system that will be introduced and installed in our midst by the end of this final decade of the second millennium. Okay? So we only talk about eight years and no more. That it will be introduced, installed, and run. And every sector of our lives will be affected. You see, when we went into this, we moved in from the iron age and we moved into as we might call it the computer age, where we are, or some call it the information age, that everything is done so quickly and everything is using computers and using telecommunication so much, such that you can transmit something that's being done in one place to the entire world at the same time that everyone can see. It's just like when they were bombing Iraq. Everyone could see the war on TV. I remember in the past when in the 60s, I guess it's the 60s, but the early 70s, when um, you had the last poets, you had Gil Scott Heron, you had all these different people talking about the revolution. The revolution will not be televised, but obviously it was. Everything that's going on in this last world order will be televised. What was going on in LA? They were able to show across the whole world what was actually going on in LA at the same time. Okay? So we see here that we have moved into this age, and now, how many people can survive without electricity? That's right, I'm with your Mennonites too. How many people out in the country, secluded, away from their people so that they can't see them, your enemies can't see you? We were given that counsel, what? 1800s? Amish and Mennonites have decided to say, hey, that's good counsel. We'll follow that. They've been following it ever since. Okay? And now we're going to see, according to the New World Order, that this is going to affect every phase of our lives, and because it's going to affect every phase of our lives, that if you were not connected to the system, it wouldn't affect you. It's just like when you um, think about it in, in 1929, when the Depression came. I spoke to some people who were um, older, who lived through that particular time as children and so forth in the late 70s, early 80s now. I asked them, well, how was it? Some of them, these were farmers, they said, um, um, he gave me an example of his father. They had their farm, his father went out and he would bring milk and eggs into the city and they would sell it. And he remembers that his father went down into town on the day the Great Depression hit and he was trying to sell his milk and eggs and nobody bought from him. So he came on back home and he said, well, we didn't make any money. They went back the next day. Yeah. Same thing. I think maybe two or three days went by and a week. And then he asked somebody, why is no one buying anything? He said, don't you know this is a depression? Don't you know all the banks closed up? Don't you know that everything isn't the same no more? So those that were in the city, it affected the disaster. Those that were out of the country that were living off the land didn't even know there was a such thing going on. Hmm. See, if we are, if we follow what God has written in the Bible, as we should, then when this thing hits us or hits the world, you know what's going to happen? It shouldn't affect the people of God at all. It should, but that's, but most likely it will simply due to the fact, because we're so tied to the world, that what? If we remember, the Bible tells us to shun death, is that right? The Bible says, oh, no man anything. Okay, that's what it says in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he says that the, um, the debtor is a servant to the lender. Okay? And we're going to see that anyone who's in debt, they're going to be in serious trouble. Okay, we should have been fleeing it like leopard. See, the Bible gives us counsel that in the last days it's going to be needed. And if you're not following it, it's going to affect you very badly. But if you've been following it, it's probably not going to affect you much. I mean, it's going to have some, you know, but it's not going to be as great as those that are going to be in. Just like today, how many people could live off the land? You see? That's the point. If you can't live off the land and they 
implement the one world economy, what will you do? If you live in the city, usually the average person, I guess, um, goes to, back to the store maybe two or three times a week. That means they keep around two or three days at the most amount of food in their um, home, okay? So overnight, in two or three days, that two or three days, you could be what? Starving. Be without food. You see? But if you was in the country and you were growing your own provisions, you don't have to worry about that, do you? No, nope. because you know, you're not living out of the ground. You're not living off the land. You're living right now, the people are living out of the store. If y'all remember, what happened in L.A. riots? Right? The people started losing. And when they started losing, they had curfews and they had all of these problems. And the first place, where did they hit? The stores. And then the first place, once everybody knew that there was riots and so forth, where did everybody start lining up outside, standing in long lines at all the supermarkets, trying to get there? And all the what? And all the gas stations so you can get out. Some people think that, hey, when this thing hits, no problem. I just gas up and leave, going out to the country. When LA, when the riots hit in LA, they said that the place was demobilized. The whole city was, you couldn't get around it. Okay, they even told you in certain places, electricity was off for five days. Now, then how could someone live without electricity for five days? Okay, if you go outside, okay, you have the night lights. If you don't have the night lights, then there's no light. What about the traffic lights? There's no electricity. How do you think the traffic lights are going to work? And then if the traffic lights aren't working, there'll be some accidents. Now, who do you think is going to go in there and pull, and pull everybody out of these problems? Nobody. So tell me, how will you get out? You won't. That's all, that's all a dream. See, we've been living in a dream world. Right now, the things are opening up, and unless we awaken out of our sleep, that's why the Bible says, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. That's why the Bible talks about us as sleeping spiritually, because as long as we sleep, everything will be moving over us so slowly, and we won't even know what's going on. And so that's where we are in time. We're just trying to now just give us a little overview so that we'll just know when we start defining certain things and when we start talking about certain things, you'll know what the Illuminati is, you'll understand what the New Age, the New World Order, all of these type of phrases that we're going to be using and that's going to be talked about throughout the day. Okay? But we see, we wanted us to realize that what's happening today, okay, and what the Bible says, okay? And we want to find out where are we actually in time. Now, what you might think when we go through some of it, especially tomorrow, some people might say, no, I, that can't be. No, nah, that's past history. No, this is this, that's the other. And I'm saying, well, what does the Bible say? You're going to have to define what the Bible says versus what you believe. And the question will be, which one holds more weight, the Bible or what you believe? When the Bible contradicts what you believe, then what do you do? You throw out the Bible or you throw out what you believe? You have to make those decisions. You have to decide on what it does say the Lord is. For the Bible says, by the word of what? Two or three witnesses shall all things be established. If you have one witness, that won't be sufficient, according to Scripture. If you have two witnesses, that's fine. But if you have three witnesses, that's even better. And the more witnesses you have in the context of the Scripture, you want to make sure that you're not going through scriptures and pulling out this scripture, pulling out this, pulling out, and it's totally out of context. They have to be in the context of the chapter of how it's described. Okay? For the Bible lets us know that. The Bible tells us that. Let's turn to Isaiah 28 for a minute so that we can see what the Bible says about this.
are out of the way. The priests and the prophets have erred, who strong drink, they have swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way, who strong grief. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no clean place. Now this is the question the Lord asks, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand knowledge? That's a big question. That's what we want to know. We want to know and we want to try to understand that. What is knowledge and what is understanding doctrine? Then he tells us, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Now notice how the Bible defines it. They gotta be precept upon precept. So we gotta make sure that we're getting the scriptures and everything in their context, okay? Line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with some stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. Now notice in verse 9 he said that he's going to teach knowledge and doctrine to them that are weaned from the breath, not the ones that are babes. For the Bible says when we come to the Lord, what are we? We start off as newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word. Okay? Which, and then once you leave that, then you move on to the next stage that you're growing up in the men and women of Christ <coughs> until you can have the meat. The Bible talks about the meat of the word. Okay? Now he also makes mentioning that he's going to speak to people in another tongue and into another language. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So we have to define what are we going to hear, what are we going to understand. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, Line upon line, line upon line, here a little bit. So do you think they would listen? If the Lord tells you this is the way it is, notice, and he says that they're rejecting it, notice what happens. That they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. Why? If we jump down to the next verse, verse 15, it says, Because they have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. So we see here that where we are in time, there's lots of things going on. We want to get a better understanding of where we are in time, what will actually be happening, and what are the events that are happening around us, and how do, and how are they applicable to what we believe and what's actually going on? Okay. Now I know we started to look. We will. Um, I think we started at half an hour late this afternoon. So we're going to be moving our, readjusting our schedule a half an hour. So we're going to finish Sabbath school around 10:30, around another 15 minutes. Okay. Now what we also want to do, okay, we wanted to um, get some input from others also, as we move into uh, other phases. So if you have a thought or something that you can share on the subject that we're looking at, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll be more than glad to talk about this. Okay, now we talked already, we were talking about the New World Order, we were talking about what happened in Kuwait, the darkness, we talked about some of the prophecy. Now, there was something that under this Illuminati, this New World Order, New Age, is something that was called the spiritual exercise of Laola. Now, we talked before about Laola. He was, a, he was a founder of the Jesuit Order, okay? Now, the spiritual exercise of Laola was um, that they believed that these illuminated ones, or Illuminati, they call them being illuminated, what they are as illuminated ones, that what happens is that they make a contract with hell and with death, just as we just read. 
They literally made a contract with Lucifer. And that's why they call the illuminated one. Or they're also called, as some might call it, Luciferian. Okay? New Age is the word, the Luciferian initiation. Okay? That's what every that's what they want to take everybody to be part of. They want everybody, every church has been basically infiltrated already. Now they're in the second phase of it is to initiate everyone in the, to this spiritual exercise of their own, which is nothing but the Luciferic initiation when you speak to New Age. See, it's, it's all, everybody uses different terminology, that's the point. Everybody's used to throwing around all these terms, and nobody knows who, what another person is talking about. Okay? Now, some people might say, well, this song is concerning me. Okay? Now, do y'all remember TM, Transcendental Meditation? That came out years back. And that had been introduced into the churches under a new name. You know what name was called? Christian Meditation. I don't know if you heard anything about mm -hmm. Christian meditation. Okay? That, that was the phraseology. So instead of you saying, well, we're using TM, they say that we use Christian meditation. And so people would use astral projection and leave out their body. Instead of them saying that they're going to leave out their body and tap on and speak to the, um, to the uh, spirit guide who will direct their lives, they said that what you do now is that you just leave your body and that you'll ask for um, entities to come in and give you counsel. Now, um, there was a tape that's called The Beautiful Side of Evil. If you haven't heard the tape, if you haven't seen the book, you need to get it. Because in there, there was this sister who believed she was following the Lord, no question about it. And she got caught up in it. And when she started taking the classes, she asked, they said, ask the three, you know, most with the um, wisest people of the world. And of course, a Christian would ask for Jesus, right? So that's what she asked for. And she asked, I think, for Moses, I think, and then somebody else. And so these spirit guides came to her. That's all they were, spirit guides. Or the Bible calls them, an Old Testament, familiar spirits. That's what the phraseology was in that term. But So they came, they spoke with her, they gave her counsel on anything and so forth. And so she said she remembers one time that they told her the class to don't do this outside of the class set. So she went and did it at home. And this time when she calls up these entities, um, it's like an elevator, I think she said that she would go up and then these entities would come in and so forth. They would leave the elevator and speak to her and talk to her. So this time she did it at home. And instead of it coming out as being Christ and these others, they came out as looking like werewolves. And it frightened her. So they said that they can change, you know. I mean, it can be Christ to you, you know, still a devil. And, you know, fear the devil is another God. So don't forget, the Bible said that Satan, it says not to be surprised, but Satan will come as a what? As an angel of light. And so she was deceived, okay? And she, oh man, I mean, she was getting into lots of things. She was even having, she, she worked with someone who was, um, they used the rosary. They had a priest there, and they had nuns all of these different things, and they would cut um, one of the ladies who was, who was guided by a spirit guide, she would cut people's heads open, take out tumors or whatever, whatever the problem was. And she would never use any anesthetics or nothing. But she was being guided by these spirits, okay? And blood would be coming out, and she would sew them up and everything. And so she was a nurse, so she knew how to stitch them up and make sure everything was okay. So that's why she was there. So she said that she's doing a great work for the Lord. You know, healing the people and working things out. And then she found out later that that was not of the Spirit of God, that was of Lucifer. So that's what I'm saying. There's different terminologies that's used. Today we call the spiritual exercise of Laola a new name. We call it NLP. That's the new phraseology we use. Neuro Linguistic Program. Okay? So if you hear that terminology, you know what, what they're talking about. Okay? See, many people don't know what all of these names are, but you can compare, if you can find a place where you can find out what the spiritual exercise of Laola is, find out what the program is of the NLP, and then go page by page of what they teach in NLP and see if it's not the same thing. I challenge you to do that. I mean, don't take my word for it. You see what I'm saying? I'm not asking you to take my word for it. 
You get that tape? Flip it over. Okay? I want you to research for yourself. The Bible says what? Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman rightly divided the word of truth. All I'm going to do is present scriptures. I'm going to present documentation. I'm going to present information. Then you have to go home and be a noble Berean and see if these things be so. Now it will be challenging because some of you might say, no, I'm not even going to study this out. Because man, it just seems too far-fetched. That's your option also. I mean, the Lord has given us minds to study. And we have to decide on what is true. And we can't be deceived in the last day. But we know that what? There will be a deception, is that right? In the last day. Okay? Matter of fact, let's turn to Timothy for a minute. Timothy chapter 3. I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1. We read this this morning in the devotion. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Okay? That's where we are. We're in a time of, I guess you might call it, very perilous times. Okay? And it goes and makes a list of different things. And so forth. I wanted to turn right over to verse 13. It said, <clears throat> But an evil man is seduces. What are seduces? Those are charms. Those are people who will seduce you right into something you don't even know about. You assume it's this, but it's something else. Seduces. But evil men and seduces shall wax worse and worse. Now, this is the catch. Deceiving. And what? <laughs> See? The same thing it reminds me of in um, Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. It says that um, um, the wicked shall do wickedly, but none of the wicked shall know. But the wise shall understand or shall know. Okay? So we see here that people are going to be deceived and be deceiving others, but at the same time they're going to be deceived. So everybody's deceiving everybody else. See? And that's where the key falls. So we want to make sure, and that's why the Bible says for you to what? Study. Study and to get ready for the times are upon us. The times are all around us. Lots of things are happening. <coughs> so we want to make sure we understand what's going on. Okay? Did, did we see any glimpses of this during the um, Republican and Democratic well, we know that's all they do. Any glimpses of this about evil Yeah, I can believe that. As a matter of fact, they said that the, um, the people, matter of fact, with the Democratic Party and all these other different things and Republicans, they will tell you what you want to hear. Vote them in. They say, well, we can't keep those promises. That's the end of that. <laughs> but, you know, that's what's going on. But we want us to understand in the spiritual realm, because this is going to be, this is where we are. And the reason why I was mentioning that is that there's many things that we're practicing, or that we believe we're practicing, or doing, or whatever. And we're finding out that it's when we research and go a little deeper, it's not all that it claims to be. Okay? So that's the reason why I mentioned these three books. The Keys of this Blood, which we're going to, uh, we read a little bit out of so far. We're going to also read out of this book. Matter of fact, I just want us to um, understand what actually happened in 1929 because it's going to be worse than that, okay? And then we also are trying to define what's going on with the New World Order. So because we have a one world government, a one world economy, and eventually a one world religion. So these are the three areas that we're going to try to define. But anyway, there's something else I want us to um, think about. I was reading an article 
Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see much of this, but yeah, eventually I will. I wish I wanted to blow it up, but I just didn't get a chance to do that. But anyway, in this particular uh, article, what it does, it shows where the sun is, it shows the Earth, it shows Mars, and it shows that there's a, um, a sphere here, okay, and it's called an asteroid belt. These are where all these asteroids are, okay? And these asteroids out there, and we're supposed to be going through some of them at certain parts of times of the year as we go revolving or rotating around the, the um, sun as we go around, that we'll be going through the asteroid belt. And it was very interesting of what they said would happen <coughs> if asteroids started hitting planet Earth. And they believe that in the 90s, they will. But I want us to um, just get a little glimpse of what they actually are saying about it. That's why I'm just presenting information during the Sabbath school, just so that when we start covering some of the details, okay, you, it'll, it'll be a refresher in your mind. But that we talk a little bit about, not a whole lot. Okay? Um, there was um, an article which I want to read. Now, there's three stages. If, if an asteroid hits planet Earth, okay? Now this I can probably hand around and people will be able to at least get a chance to uh, see this. Now with this particular one, these are the effects. And what we want you to be able to do is um, just be able to see what they're um, saying about it, okay? Now this is what they're saying, okay, as you see what's actually happening. There's three different stages. Okay, this says the scenario is stretched out of a scientific movie. Giant meteorite strikes Earth, setting planet of fire. Okay, volcano erupts, traumas crash into the continent. The sky goes dark for months. He got that up here. Oh, yeah, he's reading words. Oh, okay. Okay, the sky is dark for months, perhaps years. Is there anything in the, um, during the seven trumpets, seven seals, or seven plagues that talk about darkness over the over one third of the planet, or darkness over the king, the seat of the beast. Unable to cope with this catastrophic change, changes in climate, countless species are wiped off the face of the planet. Yet, this is the apocalypse scene scientists suggest as evidence grows that comets or meteors may indeed be agents of mass destruction on Earth. In the moments following the impact of an object 10 kilometers in diameter, experts believe a blast wave similar to that of a nuclear explosion would destroy everything within several hundred kilometers. Okay, at the top of your picture, you see the um, it's striking a water, okay? And then you see the heat and the blast and so forth. And then it talks about the intermediate results. And then it talks about short-term global effect and then long-term global effect, okay? Now, the 
reason why I thought this was interesting because they don't believe in the Bible, half of the scientists, but they were just telling us what is happening on the planet. And we are moving into an asteroid belt, and they believe that asteroids will be hitting planet Earth. Also, if you remember in some of the trumpets, the Bible talks about that there will be um, that there will be a mountain thrown into the sea. Is that right? Y'all remember that? Now, a mountain thrown into the sea, I just thought it was very interesting of how they claim that these sizes of asteroids are sizes of mountains. They're nothing but big mountains. I said, oh man, that's very interesting. Also, we know during the um, trumpets and flags that um, the Bible talks about one third of the um, green grass will be burnt up. All the green grass and one third of the trees will be burnt up. Now that we just read over here about um, Okay, it's intense heat and wind combined to set wildfires, perhaps even a global inferno. So there we go. Bible did talk about that. And so I just thought that was interesting of how um, the same effects of what the Bible said is what they said would actually be happening. Okay? It also says, if the impact occurred on land, earthquakes would rock the continent for days. Now just imagine if we had um, something to hit. What would happen to over in Los Angeles and all these other places that are just waiting for something to kick them off? I thought that was interesting, especially when we know about um, um, quotes that talk about earthquakes and so forth over in that area. If at sea, huge tremendous or those really big, huge tidal waves, as you can see, if, if you look at your picture, you'll see that the immediate effects, and it talks about that. Okay, and I think there'll be over 100 feet tall waves. What will it do to the harbor? Baltimore, Washington, Philly, could destroy coastal inhabitants. I mean, inhabitants across the globe. I know we know about that there will be great destruction in New York and Boston and the major cities. Could this be it? Other immediate effects would include a horizontal base surge of melting and polarized material and a plump of vaporized water and or rock ejected into the stratosphere over the impact crater. The fine particles eventually darken skies around the world. Okay, so there we go. As when it hits, some of the water will be vaporized and some of the rock will be polarized and folded into the sky. And it will darken the sky. When we talk about the darkening of the sky just over the burning of the oil fields in Kuwait. This was a news article at a um, Times magazine at high noon, 12 o'clock, pitch black. Okay? And they're saying that this would happen again. And the Bible says in the trumpets also, I believe, one of them, that one third of the planet would be dark. And under the flag, that the seat of the beast will be dark. Scientists are debating long term effects of such an impact. Most agree that an era of strong, Acid rain would ensue. Ensue. Some believe a global dust cloud would trigger an age of darkness and cold. Others see a sharp greenhouse effect, particularly if the object strikes, struck, and vaporized limestone in the ocean. Basis, filling the atmosphere with massive quantities of carbon dioxide. This CO2 layer could trap heat, raise temperatures worldwide. Okay, we do know that under one of the plagues, what's going to happen about the sun? It's going to 
going to burn bad. So we see, I mean, some of the things that science has said that are before us, if we like it or not, as facts in the 1990s, before the New World Order sets up their so-called one world government. We see what's happening. Okay? So I just want just to share just some of the things. Because some of the things we study today, some of the things we're going to be studying tomorrow, some of the things we'll be studying on Monday. So I'll just give you an overview so if we don't cover it today, you know it's going to be covered tomorrow or Monday. So this to help encourage some of you guys to come out each day. Okay? Because I think some of this will be covered, most of this will be covered tomorrow. Most of this that we just talked about, that's going to be covered tomorrow. We're going to go into detail, spend the whole session just on that. Okay. Well, at this time, I guess this would be a good time to break to end the first session on, uh, that we had in Sabbath school. And we'll end it with a word of prayer, and then we'll, um, then we'll follow the schedule after that. Okay, well, let's have a word of prayer first. Thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day, an opportunity to gather together to study and to understand what's actually going on. Lord, help us that we might not be kept in darkness, Lord, but that we might be wide awake, that we might be children of the light and not of the night. Help us, Lord, that we might be able to discern your spiritual understanding. And help us, Lord, that those that are on their way, that thou might bring them, th them here without hurting our day. Fill us with your spirit and guide us, Lord, and teach us and instruct us.